Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm Johannes Chan, uh, and I'll be teaching you legal system next week, uh, but this is not what I'm going to say now. Uh, I'm the moderator of these sessions, and as Paul said, uh, whether he will be mobbed depends on your reactions, so the floor is yours, and Paul is quite happy to take um, questions, comments, queries, anything, in a civilized manner, I should say. Anyone would like to take the floor? I can decide to take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, those who have studied American Constitution would know what the Fifth means. <laughs> now, come on. This is what you are uh, expected. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I'll repeat my question. Uh, the cost of legal services in Hong Kong is very high, even beyond the means of some middle class people. For example, my parents wouldn't be able to afford a civil lawsuit um, if they had been wronged in, in any way. Um, what, are, what are lawyers in Hong Kong doing about it, and, are they, and do you think they're doing enough? People can never do enough. Um, as you know, Hong Kong has, um, in terms of civil cases, um, a legal aid um, system, supplemental legal aid system, uh, that, that there is perennial debate as to um, whether or not the means test is set too low, because there are discussions, that you really have to be um, you know, on the verge of dying before you can be regarded as poor enough to apply for legal aid. Um, there is supplemental legal aid, but only for certain types of cases. Um, Hong Kong does not have uh, what other countries or jurisdictions um, have, uh, conditional fees. The Law Reform Commission um, many years ago did a report on widening access to justice in allowing lawyers to take over cases uh, for, um, on a conditional fee basis. Conditional fee means that um, lawyers can decide or agree with their clients on a no-win, no-pay basis. Now, under our current system, a lawyer cannot agree with his client to take, uh, to take his pay or to receive fees on a no-win, no-pay basis. So, so contrary to popular belief, win or lose, lawyers get paid the same amount. If people tell you, oh no, my lawyer actually says if he doesn't win, he won't charge me, that is illegal. Now, um, in Western jurisdictions, uh, many of them have um, relaxed the test or relaxed the regime. In some circumstances, people can enter into conditional fee um, arrangements. In America, of course, they even have contingency fee, namely that, this, that, the, that the lawyers can actually take a cut of the recovery of the proceeds of the winning party. Now, Hong Kong uh, doesn't even have um, conditional um, fees. Now, uh, there are debates as to whether it's feasible, etc. So, if you ask the question whether or not uh, more uh, can be done, well, yes, more can be done. But the question is, um, ultimately, I mean, all talks of social justice is a matter of the good old chestnut, um, unlimited needs versus limited resources. I mean, you can debate to the cows come home that uh, lawyers need more money to fund legal aid. No doubt, um, educators would say <laughs> educators need more funds to fund schools. Um, uh, the medical sector would say um, they need more funds to fund um, hospitals. So it, it, it's a perennial debate. I don't know the answer. I mean, if you ask, or the judiciary would say that they don't have enough funds to hire more judges. <laughs> so um, I'm not a policymaker. In an ideal world, we, we should have uh, lots and lots of more resources for the judiciary and for legal aid. But no doubt to say that uh, would offend um, others. <laughs> Just to supplement on that, of course, there are things that one can do. Um, one thing as lawyers, you can always offer your service on a pro bono basis, uh, which means free of charge. Uh, and this is what lawyers uh, could be able to do. And Paul has himself appeared as a pro bono counsel uh, in a number of cases. And many members of the bar and solicitors are willing to do that. Unfortunately, 
uh, some of the largest firms in Hong Kong do not do any pro bono service. This is one thing I'm very critical about. Uh, and uh, so one day when you become a partner of a law firm, so think about that. Uh, that's something within your ability to do. The others within the law school, we have set up a clinical legal uh, services, uh, and you will be able to take it uh, as an elective when you are in your third year. Uh, and basically, it is a clinic which we take cases from the public, uh, and we offer legal advices, uh, and if necessary, uh, go further than legal advice, uh, and with the assistance of pro bono lawyers, uh, and students are enlisted as the volunteers to help. So partly it is educational. We want to teach the students in a real-life setting when you're handling real case and real client under supervision. And at the same time, we want to nurture that kind of pro bono values that what you have learned could benefit the society. And that should start uh, from the day when you're in the law school. Yes, uh, the gentleman over there. And then that one first. Uh, since you spoke of the rule of law earlier, um, do you think that the rule of law uh, compared to compared in Hong Kong, with Hong Kong, do you think that the rule of law would be more stable in a liberal democracy? And if so, do you think that we should go to great lengths in order to make the constitutional framework of Hong Kong more accountable to the people of Hong Kong than Beijing? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. In fact, um, um, I don't have the book with me. Um, I think it's Sir Sidney Kentridge, um, you know, in his book, I think, Free Country, when he actually tried to put forward the view that true rule of law can only exist in a democracy or a true liberal democracy. So that is one view, of course. But if you ask the question, comparatively, is rule of law more um, ready or, or more likely to um, thrive um, in a liberal democracy, then I, I can't quarrel with that. Um, yes. So, how far we should we go in order to like strive for that sort of constitutional framework? Well, I'm not a political think tank. Legally speaking, the current framework um, is well documented to be unsatisfactory. <laughs> um, Johannes, on the other hand, is the member of a policy think tank. <laughs> <laughs> so he is in a better position to offer his views on, as a matter of policy, what kind of model we should um, strive for. This is, this not is the what point. I learned actually during um, tutorials. You see, so when you have a small group tutorial, you see, you can pass the bucket. Yeah, you can pass the bucket. That was a very good point, actually. So and so mentioned this to me the other day. So I passed the bucket. Uh, I, I'm not going into the, the models, but what I have been trying to do is within the legal constraint, there are uh, models that you can put forward, and, and it is still within the legal framework. Uh, and I think one of the best training of lawyers is you are able uh, to see what sort of rooms there would be to achieve certain things uh, without upsetting uh, the, the outer boundary. And I think uh, what has been proposed, indeed, there, there leaves rooms for us to do that. But unfortunately, no one listened to me. Um, to, to perhaps cover my back for being criticized as um, not giving an answer, there is a subtle difference between commenting on matter on a le from a legal perspective and offering views from a policy sort of think tank point of view. From a legal perspective, which is all I have been doing for the past couple of years, you can look at existing or proposed models and comment on whether or not, uh, as a matter of constitutional regime, whether or not they fulfill a particular aim. But if one asks the question, then you propose one which best suits or achieves a particular um, aim or objective. Now that's a completely different ballgame. Because, for example, if you say, well, there are different ways of achieving the same end, uh, a 2,000 people model, uh, a 5,000 people model, this, that, and the other. Now, those call for a good deal of uh, political research. Those call for a good deal of resources. It's not just a matter of looking at a textbook and say, oh, the law actually says you can have actually a 5,000 5, member uh, committee elected from 32 rather than uh, 12 uh, uh, subsectors. It's not as simple as that. 
um, that there is a genuine difficulty from a legal perspective in putting forward uh, concrete proposals. Is the lady in front there? Uh, the earlier one? The, uh, the, yes. Um, I believe you mentioned the democratic halo that you believe is worth defending in Hong Kong, but in regards to the human rights lawyers' disappearances, many of them disappearing on the mainland in the past month or so, do you have any advice to students who might be pursuing international human rights in this regard? Advice to students? Pursuing international human rights. Well, as um, of course, um, international human rights is a subject that can be pursued as a standalone subject. Uh, as a matter of real politic or practical reality, um, practicing human rights law within the jurisdictional limit of the mainland um, has to be regarded as something risky. I speak to many, many mainland students, law students, and many of them express the sentiment that even engaging in litigation <laughs> on the mainland is a risky business, let alone human rights or public law type litigation. Ultimately, um, you may feel that it's very cliche. Ultimately, it's really a matter of exerting whatever influence that institutions outside of the mainland can impart on uh, students from the mainland. They can absorb whatever they can or want to absorb. Now as to what they do with what they had absorbed <laughs> after they had learned about it, I mean that really is a matter for them. That there is a limit as to what um, people can do outside of the mainland and there is a limit as to what I mean non-mainland people can do. They can do all kinds of singun or whatever outside but really if you want the system to change it, it takes time. Some people say it takes one generation or two generations to change. Some may say it takes more generations to change. But what I can say is if we don't play our part in at least seeking to influence them in a good way, it takes forever to change. Um, this is an old story that I had told before. It was reported briefly in the interview. Um, I retell the story. Um, many years ago, I had a dinner discussion with a well-respected, very senior legal figure in Hong Kong. I won't say who that person is. I was lamenting that there is no lack of enlightened, open-minded scholars or lawyers or officials on the mainland who knows exactly what the attractions of what we call Western liberal legal system is, what the attractions are. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the peculiar political constraints <laughs> on the mainland, once Grandpa blows the whistle, they had all to follow the party line and to say what is expected of them. Uh, the legal figure then said to me, that is right, but there's no need to feel disheartened because they may obey the whistle now, but they may become the persons who blow the whistle later. Now, you can say it's wishful thinking because again, talking to many mainland law students, I very often ask them, what do you want to do after graduation? You want to practice as a lawyer to change it or what? Some of them say, well, I won't become a lawyer or even if I become a lawyer, I won't engage in litigation. <laughs> Some say I want to become a civil servant. Because apparently it's more prestigious to be a civil servant on the mainland than to be a lawyer or a judge. Some say, I would try to change the system once I get to a particular level, but I would work quietly. Some say, well, I don't have a lot of the IT, I would conform. I would become part of the system. If you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> Some say, I'll get a scholarship and leave. <laughs> Now, you can't generalize. I do not know how the mainland friends here would want to do. They may not find it convenient to speak out. But there, as we say in the old days, that there is an old 
TV commercial, 中國地大物博，乜人都有，多奇真異寶。So in China, there are different types of people. I mean, you can't really generalize as to how each and every one of them would make use of their knowledge that they learn here or in the West. What are your views? Well, one it reminds me of the passage by Lo Sun, which probably most of you have read uh, in one of the prefaces uh, to his book on Nap Ham. He said, if everyone remains silent, nothing will be changed. If someone starts crying out, you don't know, things might change. Uh, and I think for students, at least, uh, and you have the luxury of being in a free place in Hong Kong, uh, and voice your concern at the very least. Uh, and once you voice the concern, uh, you never know whether it will make an impact, and it may. Um, of course, the, at the end of the day, uh, what you choose to do is very much a matter of personal choice. And as Paul mentioned, there are different kinds of personal choice. And we are not advocating that everyone has to uh, uh, be on the front line. But on the other hand, um, if everyone takes the view that I don't want to be a litigation lawyer, uh, I just want to do business, I want to be a successful commercial practitioner, and one day when all the litigation lawyers has gone and the government comes around you, what happened? Uh, there's a, 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 a favorite um, passage um, in a book called A Man for All Seasons, uh, which is one of my favorites, when King Henry VIII uh, wants to change the law to allow him to divorce, uh, and the Lord Chancellor, uh, Sir Henry Moore, opposed. Uh, and there was one conversation when King Henry said that if the law of England is like a forest, I will cut to the very last tree. Uh, and Sir Henry replied, uh, yes, you can do it, and you are the very man to do it. But when you are able to cut until the very last tree, and when the devil turns around, where are you going to hide yourself? I see some hands over here. Any, anyone just now has put up their hands? Yes. Uh, though Hong Kong right now is not obviously a British colony, it's very general that the court will actually side with the UK common law and the case law. Do you think this is a healthy scenario? And also, what do you think is the ideal common law system for Hong Kong? Like, let's say, from what jurisdiction? I'm not sure about the premise that Hong Kong would naturally side with um, cases from uh, Britain. Uh, from, from what I see, um, when people research cases in Hong Kong, uh, we don't just confine ourselves to um, British textbooks. It very often really um, depends. First of all, you know we operate in an adversarial setting. Judges don't go around looking up their own research. They rely on counsel. And um, or lawyers, now we have solicitor advocates. Um, it really depends on how the lawyers present their arguments in front of um, judges. Nowadays with internet research, my experience is that in terms of case law citation, first of all, um, very often cases from outside of England and Wales are cited. Now, there are of course case situations where you could only rely on English or um, well, British case law, because for example, if that particular statute <laughs> only has a counterpart in, in, in England and Wales. But in terms of, let's say, the common law, I, I would doubt the premise that um, there is somehow a tendency just to follow um, British case law. I mean, you, you can look at the makeup of the judiciary. Um, we, we don't have what we would call predominantly British um, makeup. And especially with the rather cosmopolitan makeup of our Court of Final Appeal, um, that I do not feel any uh, particular uh, uh, tendency to only follow um, the British uh, 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 style of common law rather than, let's say, the Australian style. In fact, uh, when we talk about rules of equity, um, the Australians are pretty um, advanced. Um, and um, very often, Hong Kong cases have um, followed the Australian um, line rather than the British line. So I hope that um, uh, provides some assurance 
um, that against any fear that Hong Kong may uh, become just another colonial offshoot or uh, become a rather insular sort of um, common law um, jurisdiction. It actually is, could be pretty fascinating in that no president from any particular jurisdiction can claim to have any overriding um, uh, claim to respect. Now, of course, I can't dispute the fact that in terms of ordinary training, in terms of your textbooks in universities, by and large, people still go by British-style textbooks. But once you come out into practice, I mean, sky's the limit. Now we have firms from America, we have Australian firms coming in. Um, uh, uh, sky's the limit in terms of research, especially given internet research. I agree with Paul, and uh, one thing I, I, I can sense underlying the question is, uh, is there just one version of the common law? There are many versions of the common law. The common law in Australia is very different from the common law from New Zealand and from uh, uh, UK and so on. Um, so uh, one may have to learn that there could be more than one answer to a question, which law students sometimes would have difficulty to grasp. We are always confronted with the question of what is the right answer. Uh, the right answer is there could be more than one answer. Um, in view of time constraint, we'll take one last question. Maybe the quest ladies at the back. Um, well, my question may be quite long because I want to add about uh, critical thinking. Um, as a law student, it's important to have critical thinking, and our education institution has been emphasized on having critical thinking. But the fact is, I think we're going on a wrong direction because the student now used to demonstrate how critical they are by simply criticizing um, some laws or so the society, the education, or everything around them. It seems like we're just criticizing everything instead of like thinking about some good side about uh, things despite they may be bad, they may not be imper uh, perfect, but there's still some good side about it. So what's your opinion on this? Well, um, yes, I think it's part of what I would call the polarization of our community. And especially online, when it's a low-cost business to simply contribute and type in the words and hatoi, whatever. It's easy, right? So it's, it's a byproduct of the polarized nature of our society. It's easy to criticize. But I don't see any easy solution to it, except to say that before you criticize, you've got to back up your criticism with reason and you've got to be able not only to destructively criticize but constructively suggest how the subject that is being criticized um, can be changed because otherwise the whole community would be full of what we call fu lang lang, right? So it's bad, it's bad. So you turn around and say, okay, how do you suggest <laughs> how it can be changed then? Now, of course, for those who are hell-bent on criticizing, you can't do anything to change them. But the, the sure sign of people who criticize for the sake of criticizing would be people who simply state the conclusion without stating why and without uh, proposing alternatives. And sooner or later, if people are discerning enough, they would be able to weed out uh, rubbish like that, <laughs> hopefully, and they have no market. I was indeed asked that question many years ago by a mainland student uh, who asked why Hong Kong lawyers just tend to criticize everything uh, because everything we give them to read uh, criticize that the judgment was wrong, the call of appeal was wrong, call of final appeal was wrong, house of laws was wrong and so on. Uh, why don't you say that things are right then? Uh, uh, one is uh, if you imagine that you are in a system that just tells you everything that's right, everything hand down from the, the highest court is always right. Uh, where does the, imp the incentive for improvement comes? Uh, and I agree entirely with Paul that the criticism is not for the sake of criticism. The study of law asks you to balance. Uh, there are always encounter arguments, uh, and it is, the criticism is only the beginning of an engagement of a critical process. Uh, and that's what we want you to, rather than to learn things in a complacent manner. Um, actually, on Johannes' um, example, about um, why people always criticize. Now, of course, I've said what I've said about there's no point just criticizing. You have to back up your criticism with 
reason and propose alternatives. Um, there is actually a very good bit in the article by Sir Robert McGarry, uh, um, uh, Volume 11, Hong Kong Law Journal 152, page 163, called Humility. I won't read that out, but you try to dig it up yourself. It's about how the whole fabric of the common law starts off with criticism and disagreement. How a solicitor could give advice in one way. When he goes to counsel for a second opinion, counsel advises the other way. But when they bring in a QC or a senior counsel, senior counsel advises yet another way. When they go to the court of first instance, the first instance judge held the opposite way. When they appeal to the court of appeal, the court of appeal held yet the other way. When you appeal to the court of final appeal, it goes yet the other way. And then Yan Dai Sik Fat, it goes the other way. And then the Hong Kong Law Journal says it's all wrong. So um, part of the common law is to say why something may not be right and to explain why. Read it, read it. Um, on, on, on that note, uh, I think we, we might have to conclude this part of the proceedings uh, in the interest of time. Uh, and I'm sure that um, you, uh, Paul has incited a large number of questions there. I'm, I'm, I can see that a number of students may still have further questions. And if we succeed in inspiring you to have more questions, that we have achieved the purpose. Uh, this is exactly what we want to achieve in teaching, is to engage you. Uh, and let me thank Paul for this very uh, enlightening and provocative sessions. Thanks. Did you say thought-provoking or provocative or both? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Paul.